Hello there, and welcome back to this. Today, I want to talk about time travel again. Specifically, I want to talk about time travel in the movie Donnie Darko. Not so much about Donnie Darko itself, but we will talk about that. And we'll talk about some other movies too, and so there will be spoilers, although I'm going to do my best to avoid them. Uh, apologies ahead of time. So when we talked last time about time travel, that was in regards to Dinosaur Train. And yeah, that's a little weird, but... Stay with me here. Donnie Darko is a movie that came out... God, when did it come out? Was it 2001, maybe? Yeah. Uh, it has Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Maggie Gyllenhaal. It's a bunch of people. Patrick Swayze. And uh, it's kind of a cult following movie. Um, it's really kind of a unique, uh, quirky movie. I mean, I could sit here and explain the premise to you, and you just wouldn't it, it's weird uh and i absolutely adore it uh it's one of my favorite movies um and time travel plays a big part in this movie although it it doesn't seem like it on the surface even though they talk about time travel a lot uh it is a time travel movie and uh i'm already off course talking about when we talked about time travel and, you know, in media, in fiction, I told you there was like three types of time travel. And we'll, where we stand up here, there is the, the mutable timeline. And that's your like your back to the future where you can go into the past and change something and your future changes. Like you can go back to the future and something's different, but it's the same. It's one timeline. There is the immutable timeline. And that's where... You can't, you can go into the past and you can try to change things, but you can't. Timeline, the time is set. You can't change things. Uh, sometimes there's some wiggle room with that where, you know, big things you can't change, but little things you can. Uh, and my brain is stumbling to find a, a uh, sense of that. I, I Before I used the, the Time Machine movie, and I can use it again, uh, where... The sense of it is like the the guy the guy builds a time machine to save his wife from dying, and in the end, and he keeps on failing. Like he goes to the moment which he's about to die, and he can't stop it, no matter what he does. And the reason that he can't stop it, because again, time is in, immutable; we can't change it, is the fact that had she not died, he wouldn't have created the time machine. So it's just it's a paradox; he can't break it. Uh, and that's that's that, um, and then you know a, a, a shake off from that one I suppose is the like the divergent timelines or uh, multiple timelines multiverse, which most familiar now is going to be like the MCU universe and and Loki, where you can go back in time and you can change something, but that timeline diverges into a new timeline, and that is a new reality. And your reality stays the same, had you done it or not. Like, again, you can't change your reality, but it makes a new reality. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here, because Donnie Darko technically falls into that uh, time travel. And um, and like I said, I don't want to... I mean, we're going we're gonna to talk about the movie, but I'm going to be very vague, and I'm not... Well, after... I'm not going to talk about the movie, if, if, if this makes sense. What I, what I want you to do, you, you, right now, if you haven't seen Donnie Darko, if you haven't seen it in a while, uh, really anyone, that's, that's just stop. I'll do it too. Stop what you're doing right now, and I want you to go watch Donnie Darko, and then come back to this video. I'll wait. 
and I'm doing this because, okay, they, so there's two versions of Donnie Darko. There's the original cut, and then there's the director's cut. And in theory, the director's cut should be great because it explains everything as the movie goes on. It explains things as what's what's going on. And the problem is, is it takes all the joy out of the movie. And I want you, you, to watch this movie untainted with knowledge. Okay? So right now, I want you right now, pause this video, and go watch Donnie Darko. I'll wait, I'll do the same. Okay? Now. Two hours later. Okay, you watched it, great. Yeah, like I told you, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a weird movie. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the philosophy of, philosophy of time travel. It is the book that exists in the movie uh, that you never see, at least in the, the regular cut. Uh, you don't see any of the contents, but it explains what's happening. And... I'm just going to read bits of it because it's it's the the book itself. Like they they released it after the movie, and it's short. It's it's totally just a supplemental thing. Um, and I said I'm going to read from it. There's there are twelve chapters, and they're all just a couple like a paragraph long each. And uh, we'll go through it and we'll talk about it. And I will talk about why I like this concept of time travel. So let's start off. Like I said, this is this book is called the philosophy ugh, philosophy of time travel. Actually, let's make it apropos for Donnie Darko. Put on my hoodie. It's eighty eight degrees outside, so we're gonna die. But right. Philosophy of Time Travel by Roberta Ann Sparrow. And I'm going to skip the foreword. And we're going to go into chapter one, which is called The Tangent Universe. Now, like I said, this is... This is what's going on. And this is the most important thing. So this is what it says. The primary universe is fraught with great peril. War plague, famine, and natural disaster are common. Death comes to us all. The fourth dimension of time is a stable construct, though it is not impenetrable. Incidents when the fabric of the fourth dimension becomes corrupted are incredibly rare. If a tangent universe occurs, it will be highly unstable, sustaining itself no longer than several weeks. Eventually, it will collapse upon itself, forming a black hole within the primary universe, capable of destroying all existence. So, what does that mean? It means that there is, you know, what I was talking before, so there's one timeline. There's the primary universe. And, oof, yeah, I can't do it. Primary universe. And sometimes... A tangent universe happens, and that's where something pivotal happens, and a tangent universe is created. And uh, these tangent universes are—it's a bubble, like it's a—it's just—it's—it's it's never big. It's never like the whole world. It's—it's—it's it's a, it's a physical, almost like a physical bubble, like it's—it's it's a time and place of people contained. And this universe is, is temporary, this tangent universe. It's unstable. It's going to collapse. And if it collapses, it's going to take all of reality with it. So that's what I said. The tangent universe is the, the important thing here. Let's go on to chapter two. And this is just setting the basis of understanding of like how this works. Like it's setting rules. Uh, and some of these are help, like helpful up front, and some of them are not. Uh, chapter 2 is called Water and Metal. And 
Water and metal are key elements of time travel. Water is the barrier element for the construction of time portals, used as gateways between the universe and the tangent vortex. Metal is the transitional element for the construction of the artifact vessels. All right, so we're going to talk about the artifact vessels in the next chapter. I don't know why it does this. It talks about things before. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, but what you need to understand is, I mean, this is simple, is that time travel is possible through portals. And these portals are always constructed of water. And metal are the vehicles in which you can travel with that. So it has to be metal. Like it's it's basic. Like the, the just bear with it. And if you watch the movie, you, you've already understood. Like, I mean, you you might have an idea of what I'm talking about now. But just bear with me. Huh. I'm sorry. The <laughs> the uh the thing I'm using as a uh as a basis here, it doesn't have all the chapters because we just did chapter two and the next chapter is chapter four. Oh, I wanted this to be a good video and I'm gonna have to just Yeah, bear with me one moment. I'm gonna leave this in there because because that's really annoying. Huh. I guess that's how it works. All right. I never noticed that in the book. All right. So there are there are 10 sorry, 12 chapters, but there are only visible chapters of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8. So again, this book, fictional book has 8 chapters, but apparently we only have access to eight. I'm sorry, 12 chapters, but we only have access to 8. I never noticed that before. Oh, that's awful. Anywho, push forward and on. So, who knows what chapter three was? <clears throat> chapter four is the artifact and the living. When a tangent universe occurs, those living nearest to the vortex will find themselves at the epicenter of a dangerous new world. Artifacts provide the first sign that a tangent universe has occurred. If an artifact occurs, the living will retrieve it with great interest and curiosity. Artifacts are formed from metal, such as an arrowhead from an ancient Mayan civilization or a metal sword from medieval Europe. Artifacts returned to the primary universe are often linked with religious iconography. Iconography, as their appearance on Earth seems to defy logical explanation. Divine intervention is deemed the only logical conclusion for the appearance of an artifact. All right, so there's there's a lot going on in this chapter, and uh, again, if you watch the movie, I think you can guess what the artifact was. But so. An artifact is, like I said, is the what this says is the first sign that a a tangent universe has occurred, and usually it's a metal object falling from the sky from a portal. And they mentioned the living here, and the living is an individual, which I think we'll talk to next. Let's just say that this is tied to a to one person and uh, the goal I mean and uh, these appearance of these artifacts uh, and you know it just talks about like, the appearance of artifacts artifacts is like religious uh, and I would say like the tangent universe is itself but basically it's just these things happen and we don't know why uh, but a higher power seems to be the likely reason and that's uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm not, I'm not all about promoting a, uh, divine intervention, uh, or anything, even my, in my media, but I like, 
the I, I like the unknown or the 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 god element in this. So like sometimes just things just happen. You can call that God, you can call that whatever, but just things happen. Uh, we can find out more and it'd be something called science, but from a place of, of ignorance, which is where we're at, where this is at, this happens, we don't know why, but it happens. So, these artifacts fall out of the sky, and they're usually, like, impossible things. So... Uh, again, in the context of the movie, it's very obvious what this impossible thing was. Um, it's just something like there's 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 no way that this thing could be here right now. And it, it's it in itself is a paradox. That's the artifact. Chapter six. So we can skip chapter five. Chapter six is going to talk about the living, and it's called the living receiver. The living receiver is chosen, chosen to guide the artifact into position for its journey back to the primary universe. No one knows how or why a receiver will be chosen. The living receiver is often blessed with fourth dimensional powers. These include increased strength, telekinesis, mind control, and the ability to conjure fire and water. The living receiver is often tormented by terrifying dreams, visions, and auditory hallucinations in, during his time during the Tangent Universe. These surrounding the living receiver, known as the manipulated, will, tr will fear him and try to destroy him. So, we talk about in chapter 4, so in chapter, here in chapter 6, we're going to talk about the receiver the living receiver. And this is the person that's going to fix this. And we'll talk more about fixing it. Uh, but basically, you know, it's pretty obvious, and I'm not spoiling anything, Donnie Darko is the living receiver in Donnie Darko. And you can see demonstrated throughout the movie of strength, telekinesis, mind control, and the ability to conjure fire and water. They play that fast and loose. I'm not going to get into it, but like, that's just, you know, that's play along. That's, that's suspend our belief. There are superpowers from the fourth dimension. And surrounding the people around, around him, around the living receiver, are they manipulated? And they just come to fear and destroy him. They are people. Everyone has a part to play in this. Uh, and we're going to talk more about the, the manipulated now. Then there's two kinds. Chapter 7. The manipulated living. The manipulated living are often the close friends and neighbors of the living receiver. They are prone to irrational, bizarre, and often violent behavior. This is the unfortunate result of their task which is to assist the living receiver in returning the artifact to the primary universe. The manipulated living will do anything to save themselves from oblivion. Now, like I said, with the, the, the powers from the previous chapter, they're playing it fast and loose with the manipulated here, is that it's, it's very unclear on the people in this tangent universe how cognitive or aware of the role they're playing and what they're doing. Uh, Donnie kind of gets an idea because he has a copy of this book and he sees that it's a reply, applying to him. Um, the other people around it, it's not clear. It's not clear in the movie and it's not, it's just not clear. Uh, again, you know, talking about divine intervention and fate, which are, uh, man, What's the word? Fixed destiny. Uh, can can you change time? Can you? Do you have any uh, free will? Who knows? And that's stuff that you know plays nice into the uh, the immutable timeline, and to a lesser extent, the uh, tangent tangent the the, multi, the divergent timelines of time travel. And uh, I think it's a it's a uh, 
it's worth you know thinking about. That's why I like time travel. I like thinking about like the, the consequences and the just how this all works. It's just a fun story plot device. I, I just I love it. So yeah, so we have the manip manipulated living. The people close to the to the living receiver are acting weird, going a little crazy. We are skipping chapter eight. And we're going to chapter nine. And uh, again, this the way these they talk about stuff here it just doesn't make sense to me. But we talk about we we name drop things before we say what they are. So chapter nine is the insurance trap. The manipulated dead will set an insurance trap. The living receiver must insure the fate of all mankind. So we haven't talked about the manipulated dead yet. But basically, is they their job is to trap the living receiver into a thing where they must. They have no choice but to send that artifact back. Chapter 10 is the manipulated dead. And before I get it, the manipulated dead are the most fascinating thing to me of this philosophy of time travel and how it works in the movie and possibly elsewhere. Uh, let's read it and we'll talk more about it. And it's also probably one of the longest ones here, so bear with me. The manipulated dead are more powerful than living receiver. If a person dies within the tangent dimension... They are unable to con ugh, excuse me. They are able to contact the living receiver through the fourth dimensional construct. The fourth dimensional construct is made of water. The manipulated dead will manipulate the living receiver using this fourth dimensional construct. There's some penises. We're not gonna show that, but you saw it in the movie. The manipulated dead will often set an insurance trap for the living receiver to ensure that the artifact is returned safely to the primary universe. If the insurance trap is successful, the living receiver is left with no choice but to use his fourth dimensional powers to send the artifact back in time into the primary universe before the black hole collapses upon itself. <clears throat> All right. So, like I said, this is, to me, the most interesting chapter. And because it, it, it prevents, it gives away the game a little bit, but it also, you know, it, the manipulated data are fascinating to me. Because, like it says here, they, they truly have supernatural powers as far as in this tangent universe to manipulate and to trap the living receiver into what they need to do and it says here like they contact through the the fourth dimensional construct which we already talked before is <clears throat> a port that basically that's a portal so they can use time travel within this tangent universe to to make things happen and uh there's un, there's an unofficial sequel. I mean, it is a sequel, but it's not by the same people of Donnie Darko called S. Darko, which is his sister. It's his sister. And uh, it it plays a lot in this chapter as far as with the manipulated dead. Uh, it's not a great movie, but it, you can appreciate it if you appreciate this, the philosophy of time travel. Uh, when I say that it gives away the game a little bit, because it, it tells you what has to be done and how the more that like we already know that the artifact has to go back to the primary universe, but this says it has to go back in time. So this is where the time travel comes in is that it has time has to be reset to right before the this tangent universe occurs. And the way you do that is is by sending that artifact back. The last chapter is called Dreams. 
uh, and like we just this is chapter twelve. We skipped chapter eleven again. I don't, I don't know. But dreams. When the manipulated awaken from their journey into the tangent universe, they are often haunted by the experience in their dreams. Many will not remember. Those who do remember the journey are often overcome with profound remorse for the regretful actions buried within their dreams. The only physical evidence buried within the artifact itself, all that remains from the lost world. Ancient myth tells us of the Mayan warrior killed by an arrowhead that had fallen from a cliff where there was no army and no enemy to be found. We are told of the medieval knight, mysteriously impaled by the sword he had not yet built. We are told that these things occur for a reason. So, and that, in a sense, now you you kind of kind of understand what happened in, in the end of Donnie Darko again. You know, it, it tells us specifically what we what we saw before about the artifact, where it talks about the Mayan arrowhead, and it talks about the medieval knight's sword, and that the living receiver, you know, and it's it's called a trap. Like, it's not just as simple as you send the artifact back, everything's great. The, the trick here is, is that whatever this is, whatever seals, whatever cuts off the tangent universe, the living receiver has to die, usually by the artifact's hand. And so after these tangent universes expire, go away, we're left with a dead living receiver, a dead person, from an impossible object. So in the movie, again, it's, it's, again, it's clear what the the uh what the artifact was and who the living receiver was and how what happened with that um and that the mysterious origin of that is still there it just it's just things happen so the arrowhead that fell that that fell from the sky with the that the mayan warrior you know obviously used you know went through this whole process to send that arrowhead back to the moment that it fell is killed by that arrowhead the knight is impaled by the sword he hadn't even built yet all these things are re the results of an insurance trap and that's that's what it is so it's time travel in that sense so there's time travel within the tangent universe and then there's time travel to erase the tangent universe. And that, again, I, I love it. So now we've talked about it. I'm hoping that you can kind of see how this apply, loosely applies to Donnie Darko and the story in that. You know, what happens and who who's what. Uh, I talk about it. So, um I like I said I like this a lot. I, even though it has kind of a free will overflow and you know do do ex machina um, feel to it, I like these rules and I like the story that it, you can tell with that. Um, and it applies to other things. One of these days, when I am fully crazy and insane enough to do it, we're going to talk about dark fully uh with time travel it's just it's so the timeline is so complicated and the one of the things the many things i love about dark is that i can actually you can actually apply the philosophy of time travel to it which is which is fun to me uh because you know you don't see this in other media it's just something that's associated with donnie darko um i probably want to revisit this later uh, probably just actually go through and explain who is what and how and, and how this works in the movie itself. Uh, 
But I just kind of want to, I just want to cover the basics of the philosophy of time travel itself. It's just a, as an, as a time travel concept. And uh, some other time travel stuff I think we'll talk about. I think we'll probably, even though it's kind of in flux right now, I want to talk about the MCU time travel concepts, and the timelines and all that. But like I said, it's it's a little crazy right now, and the next couple of movies are going to play in that a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that's it for right now. I've rambled on for far too long. And I'm sure this is going to come off very incoherent. I apologize. If you want to talk about time travel, please hit me up in the comments. Uh, hit me up in social media. I love to talk about time travel. And I, I, you know, let me know what you want me to talk about. Um, and that's that. I hope you all have a great day, week, month, year whatever do your best and i'll talk to everyone later bye and i find it kind of funny i find it kind of sad the dreams in which i'm dying are the best i've ever had i find it hard to tell you i find it hard to take People run in circles, it's a very, very mad world.